Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Martha Campbell. Uh, I'm MFA's communications manager and I wanna welcome you to tonight's We'll Talk with Artists. Uh, our digital discussion tonight is with sculptor Jane Schatz. She works prim primarily with pottery uh, until uh, she had uh, back problems later in her life and that forced her to start um, um, uh, working with canvas, shaping it in similar ways to what she did for clay. Uh, I would also like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the release, recently retired head of adult programs for the National Gallery of Art. Uh, Will is uniquely qualified to help bridge the gap between artists and the public, and he'll be our guide through the art world tonight. All right. Thank you, Martha, uh, for that nice introduction and for your help again this evening. And Jane, uh, thank you for agreeing to subject yourself to this, or I mean, participate in this. Uh, and uh, I'd like to say before Jane and I begin our conversation that I think that she has um, a really interesting background and uh, very wonderful art. My wife and I are fortunate to have one of her uh, wall pieces of the type that we'll be talking about uh, that we got at Collector's Choice. So everybody get your tickets for Collector's Choice. You might be able to get a Jane Chance. Um, and the other thing I found about Jane is that the artists that I've interviewed so far have all different paths that they have followed to their creative life and through their creative life. But Jane has, um, unlike all the others, a PhD in addition to uh, extensive training in the studio, and then a long career as an educator uh, in the arts. And now she's been able to devote um, the uh, recent uh, portion of her life solely to her art. Not many of the artists have had all of that kind of uh, credentialing and training, and then being able to have a substantial part of their time to devote to their solely to their creative work. So I think that's kind of interesting. And Jane, I wonder if you'd begin by just summarizing how you came to the stage of your life and career that you're currently in and producing such wonderful work. Um, well, first of all, thank you, um, Martha, for coordinating this and for Will for with your diligence and your work in getting these talks together and for the MFA for uh, putting this all together. I really think this is a wonderful thing that uh, we have for us. Uh, for me, I started right, I started as an undergraduate in school in upstate New York. Well, my cat is dragging things down from the table. Uh, I started in upstate New York as an undergraduate with three men and we put together a pottery studio. And I was there for about um, four or five years after college. And then I moved into my own studio and I moved around, but I had my own studio until I basically retired from pottery making um, about three years ago. So that's about a career of about 48 years of working in clay. I taught clay, I wrote about clay, published articles on glazes and historical work. Um, my degree was in prehistoric ceramics. So I was very interested in the archeology span and anthropology of clay uh, with Neanderthals up to the um, Pal Paleolithic people and forward. And that's always stayed with me. I grew up in Long Island and then I moved up upstate New York, but my childhood was in, in Long Island, which actually brought me here because when I was just ready to retire, my husband and I went to Annapolis and I smelled the Chesapeake and I fell in love. And I said, this is where I wanna be. And it was so clear, it was all over eight years later. The two days after I left my job, we had bought a house before we moved in and it was all over. There were no questions. I just knew that this was the next place for me and I had no, no thoughts about that. So I continued working, teaching in high school ceramics and sculpture. And I also ran a, a program in upstate New York in a co junior college. I ran the ceramic program with a gallery there. And I had a really great time teaching, making art, writing about art, the whole, the whole thing, it all kind of made sense. And 
this pandemic has been so strange because my whole life has been very isolated and quiet. When you're, when you're a writer or when you're an artist, you all know that your life is very quiet and you work by yourself. But when you teach, you really you know, communicate and work with people. And I had no access to people as we all have none. And that was difficult for me. But what it did was it made me have, I think this year, now that I do see it's coming to an end, I do see this year has been one of the most fruitful and growth experiencing years I've ever had because I had to go into myself and I stopped using glazes and I went into painting on pots as well as on canvases. And then I moved the canvases the same way I worked my clay and sculpture and it all started to make sense and they started to combine. And I was working with new mediums, new materials, and I was forcing materials like using acrylic paints on clay vessels, mm -hmm. which is a no-no. But I was used to doing lots of no-nos. Says who? Well, in 1973, when I went from cone 10 reduction down to cone six oxidation, that was a real no-no. Yeah. And I was called a hobbyist, which I didn't understand that because well, Jane, I Jane, let me interrupt you there because I think that uh, you're in your own way coming to a crucial point that I wanted to ask you about. When you talk about uh, the way that the year of COVID has allowed you to sort of turn in introspective to some degree and change what you're doing and the way you're thinking about your creative work, um, that linked up with what I've had in the back of my mind. You have all this academic background and training. And sometimes I feel like my academic background gets in, in the way. And in a, in a sense, what you're just saying about no-nos, isn't it your academic mentors and teachers that are sort of upholding the canon and telling you, no, no, you can't do that. You can't be one of us and do that. That's, that's very... That's very strange to say this. When I did my master's, I found the academic community to be, community to be incredibly beautiful and wonderful. To me, when I worked on my master's, it was the most intellectual period of my life. When I worked on my PhD, I saw something totally different. People, I, had, I, had to, I did it as an independent program and I had to develop my own dissertation committee. And I had artists from Rochester University, anthropologists from uh, State University of New York. My, men, my reader was from Cornell. And I'll tell you, no one liked the fact that I was an artist getting a PhD. They said, why don't you go for an MFA? My master's was an MA. And I says, I want a PhD. I was always an academician and I want that terminal degree and I want that to because I was doing an, a, um, uh, an independent study degree through the Union Institute in Ohio. Uh, my, uh, my, my master's was through Goddard College. More people are familiar with Goddard College, uh, but the Union Institute is the next step for people who like to do independent learning. I just felt that I could force whatever program I wanted to. And I wanted to do a PhD where I would incorporate the intellectual, the academic, the academic and the history, as well as the art, which I did. And um, I think that uh, for me, the, uh, the COVID experience was, was bringing me into myself so much that all of this was expressing themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny what you said, because I just want to say one thing, you know, your will talks, your talks, and I don't know you as the program that you did over at the National Gallery, but I see this part of you as your artwork. I, I don't say making a vessel, making a painting, teaching a class, writing, an, writing a paper on, on something about ceramic art. I don't see them as different. I oh, see I, them all I, as the same. I appreciate what you're saying and I agree with you. I think that's uh, very insightful. Not everybody looks at it that way. A lot of people, you know, want to pigeonhole us. Uh, but uh, I don't, and I don't want to belabor this because you and I might be able to talk about this in uh, a great deal. Uh, but I think people really want to see the art and your art is very uh, beautiful. But the last thing I want to say about it is 
I found all of my academic studies uh, very intellectually stimulating and rewarding, and I don't regret a minute of it. But when I say it gets in the way of my work, sometimes it's because people, if they know that I have uh, an advanced degree in the history of art, they look at my photographs and they want to say, oh, you must have been thinking about this photographer or that photographer. And no, I don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in all the photographs I've made in the last 10 or 12 years, maybe once or twice I tripped the shutter and thought, when I looked at the view screen, I thought, oh, well, that's sort of like so-and-so, once or twice at most. So that's why I say it kind of, to me, it gets in the way sometimes. But anyway, let's look at your work now uh, that people have a little bit of a better idea about how you prepared and how you came to this point. So let's skip that. <laughs> um, so this is uh, something that you did uh, a while ago, but fairly recently, and it's stoneware and glaze, and it's a, a, a platter. Why a platter and not a, a vessel? When I think of stoneware, I think of vessels. Well, I, I was doing pottery, I was doing functional pottery for many, many years. So platters are uh, something that I make to sell. I oh, mean, okay. people buy plates, people buy platters. It, this was a very big selling item for me. But for me, when I looked at a platter, it was the same thing I did when I looked at tile work that I did on the wall. It was a painting for me. And I, I dealt with the platter more as a painting than I did as a form. Uh, the three dimensional, the more cylindrical vessels that I made, I dealt more with uh, more pottery like mm -hmm. uh, forms that you might be used to. But to me, a plate is almost like a, a canvas, a wall painting. Um, and another thing, though, uh, that relates to the topic we were just uh, addressing about our academic preparation, we were in college and graduate school at around the same time. And I remember uh, that. Uh, there were a lot of the sort of uh, contemporary ceramicists when we were in college were on the West Coast and they were dealing heavily in uh, stoneware, but they were turning to a guy, uh, Robert, I think, Arneson. Arneson, yes. Yes. So were those people, were you aware of those people? Were they affecting the way that you evolved and thought about using stoneware? Well, uh, first of all, I loved Arneson. And yes, I was very much aware of the uh, West Coast people because I was a ceramic historian and I lectured on all aspects of ceramic uh, his history. But I was more influenced in my work from the uh, East Coast artist, the Alfred School, which was this reduction um, beige and st very stoneware, very utilitarian, uh, strong, bold. It was all men, it was all men. Uh, but it, it was the East Coast Alfred School. So that's what influenced me when I first started working. When I later, uh, as I got involved with sculpture and I got involved with sculpture about, I oh, would say five, five years into the pottery making, I knew I just didn't want to do pottery solely. I did want to do sculpture and I got involved with wall pieces, very big ones, five to six feet wall pieces. Um, I looked to the West Coast artists more for that mm -hmm. because they were doing um, well, the funk art period, uh, the pop art period, they were doing such wonderful things. And I fell in love with Dan Rhodes and, and uh -huh. Paul, and Paul uh, Soldner. These are the people that really grabbed me and they were the West Coast people. Yeah, yeah. Did you find as you were uh, studying and then when you began your teaching uh, and creative uh, life after school, after uh, college and graduate school, that you were running into a bias against women making always art. always when i was younger and i was in my 20s when i was building kilns with the with the three men that i i lived on a commune and we had a pottery commune as well as a farm how uh -huh. 70s can you get yeah <laughs> but we were very serious we worked very hard and we built our we built a, a 40 cubic foot kiln and then an 80 cubic foot kiln the 80 cubic foot kiln was a kiln that i could walk into uh -huh. We built our own burners and I used to go to, it wasn't Home Depot, it was the one that was before Home Depot, I forgot what it was called, um, but it was like Home Depot and I would walk into Home Depot as a 
woman trying to get somebody to help me with pump pl uh, with uh, plumbing parts for burners or for cement or whatever I was dealing with. And they'd make fun of me or they'd laugh at me and they wouldn't take me seriously or they'd ignore me and they'd talk to Ace somebody hardware else. Ex huh? Ace Hardware did the same thing to you. And all of the hardware stores. I mean, yeah. funny that these are the people that I had the hardest time because I was building all my own um, machinery and equipment and it was no good. And now when I go into Home Depot, it's, yes, ma'am, what can I help you with? I mean, yeah. it's a different world. Well, that's and, good news. Did, yeah, did that, yes. did that um, bias affect you in the studio, in the gallery, or in the classroom directly related to your art in any way? Well, I had a little bit of anger um, over the years. Um, I didn't think I was taken seriously enough. Um, I, had, I applied to Alfred to go to graduate school and I drove there in a blizzard for my, they asked me to come in for an interview. And I'll never forget, it was a question that was asked of me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to make beautiful pots. And he said, well, then go home and make beautiful pots. Um, there was not one woman on staff at the time. I was, I was applying to go to do my master's there. I wasn't applying for a job. I was applying to go for a graduate school. And I guess I did not... Um, have the brutish bullyish kind of thing that they were looking for so i drove home that day and it blizzard again it was a 12-hour trip and i just never forgot that yeah. and i always felt that being a woman in a in a very masculine muscular kind of field yep. was very difficult but i was also very lucky i'll say one thing potters are some of the greatest people I have ever known in my life. If you want help, go find a potter. You want someone to share information, go find a potter. Everybody was willing to share. But now, because I'm one of the co-producers of a uh, four, four day conference in Virginia, the Clay Connection Conference. So we hire these really nationally known people to come in and entertain for a weekend on stages. Some of these people, they don't want to give up their glaze information or this or that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different world now than it was when I was in my 20s, 30s, and even 40s. So, yeah. but I still know that um, it's just very different now. And it's great to be in an art form. I guess it's any field that you're in, any work that you do. You see it for, if you're there for enough years, you see uh, the change. And I think the change is, is great now. Yeah. The thing that I'm seeing now that is, very, very big. Um, and I think the BMA just started working uh, more in this format, is that the whole thing of bringing in more uh, racially diverse artists. This is the big thing now, and I'm very happy about that. And women may have to go in the back a little bit because I think there's another force that's coming forward, but that's okay. Yeah. It's a time for the new, and I think the new is a racially diverse population coming to the forefront in their yeah. artwork, and I welcome it. Well, in, in the academic field of art history and the museum world, I can tell you that I did not have any classmates or fellow students who were other than Caucasian men and, and women until I began working at the National Gallery. Right. And um, that change is continuing, fortunately, but boy, the field of art history was a lot of white men and women who yep. were from, you know, comfortable family backgrounds to say the least. So uh, let's go back to your work though. And um, you have told me a lot about your glazing and, and you mentioned uh, in your earlier comments about uh, creating your own glazes. Uh, were these um, uh, production glazes, uh, commercial glazes, or did you create the ones that are on this particular platter? These were all my own glazes. Uh, the black glaze in the back is a gunmetal black that was uh, a very good glaze for me. It sold a lot of pieces. Um, it was a glaze that, a lot, of, a lot of my glazes I copied from my, my, my cone 10, people that don't know it, it's the, the high gas fired yeah. reduction kiln. I copied it, that's what I was doing. 
uh, that's how I got known, is I duplicated those glazes into cone six, like a lower firing temperature oxidation, different uh, firing atmosphere. So mm -hmm. I was able to duplicate all my glazes. Um, and uh, the glazes were my own. Uh, I, I mixed my, my glazes up. It was very work intensive. That's why when I left, uh, retired from the pottery making, it was because I had to stop making glazes. I could buy clay and have it delivered, but the mixing of the glazes and bringing all the materials in, that was very, very work intensive. And I never worked with commercial glazes. I can't do that. Yeah, I was kind of glad uh, my one semester in the um, ceramic studio, if I wanted to continue, I would have had to learn how to mix and make my own glazes. And that was of no interest to me at all. <laughs> oh, I loved it. I loved it. Well, I was graduating and I was going to graduate school in yeah. art history, so it really was a nice clean break. But I did love my time in the in the studio. All right, Martha, let's uh, look at the next slide, please. I want to know most of all, and I and I hope you don't mind me saying this, Jane. Why did you call this piece Barcelona? Okay, well, this is good for you. This is fun for you. Look at the form. I had just come back from Spain. I saw Guernica. Oh, okay. All right. I, I was thinking it might have something more to do with the dance, but yeah, as soon as you say it, there it is. There it is. It's the <laughs> horse's mouth, you know, yeah. so many of the forms on there. Yeah, yeah. So um, see, this is 48 by 30. This is a pretty impressive sized piece. Uh, is, it, is it more or less? flat uh no nothing I, I i don't make flat it's all um it's moving it's sculptural but uh -huh. it is flat on a wall it's mounted on wood it's two pieces it's a top piece and a, and a smaller piece because my my kiln is only three feet wide so i gotcha. have to make things in segments but the wood is is a one piece and then it gets adhered to the wood and then hung from that from there and it's porcelain and it's about three different glazes that are poured. Well, as soon as you said uh, Guernica, of course, it, uh, it's, uh, it comes right into focus, if you will. But the blue and the earth tones did make me think of the Mediterranean and a lot of the architecture, uh, uh, more you know, traditional architecture that's in Barcelona. Do the colors have any significance? No, regard? the colors were just beautiful colors that would work on porcelain and white. I worked with porcelain and stoneware, and these colors work really beautifully on the white. And also, you know, of course, it was influenced from that fantastic mural that I saw. Yeah. But when I translated it into clay, for me, then it became, uh, when I said before, I started to say that I grew up in Long Island, I grew up by the ocean. So everything was seashells and very organic. And a lot of my work, as you can see, oh, yes. that is very organic and coming from seashell forms, that this actually took on more of these organic forms for me. And uh, I knew it had to be in the light blues. I didn't want to do it in dark colors. It yeah. needed to be in these blues. Now, when we were talking earlier before uh, tonight's uh, discussion, you mentioned uh, rather emphatically your change from using stoneware to porcelain. Why did you do that? And what was the significance of making that change? It's a different aesthetic. The stoneware has a grog in it, which, which makes it stony. And it gives it a lot of strength. And usually people that work in porcelain, they, they're, told, they're said to be masochists. Because porcelain, the very nature of porcelain, it has no grog in it. It doesn't have uh, in strength, you have to really know how to throw if you're going to throw with porcelain. And I threw with porcelain and I sculpted with porcelain. It's like working with cream cheese. The fun for me, the, for me, working in my art form, no matter what it was, whether I was throwing a bowl, sculpting a wall piece or painting on a canvas now, it's the process for me more than any other thing. If I don't have fun making the work, that I don't do that form. I have to have fun, I have to love it. And working in porcelain is incredibly satisfying just for the tactile part of it. It's so smooth. 
Yeah, it's funny that you uh, emphasize that, or it's not funny, it's interesting uh, that you mentioned that because in my one semester of ceramics, the instructor, the professor, uh, actually had us experiment with porcelain um, and um, you know the commercial clay that you get, it's almost like the kind of clay you use when you're a kid and then stoneware, everybody was into stoneware. So everybody was real anxious, let's get the stoneware. And nobody really did anything with the porcelain because it was so hard to, to use, you know, and right. we were just beginning, you know, ceramics 101. Um, well, you certainly make use of it in a very compelling way. Martha, uh, next slide. This Jane, before, you, before I ask you anything or you say anything, the piece that my wife and I have is from this series. Uh, and I think they're just endlessly fascinating. And of course you call it torso, but am I way off base if I say I see lots of different kinds of creatures, forms, beings in this particular piece or this series of yours? It's anything you want it to be. You know that you know that whole thing. It's it's everything that you want it to be. Um, the the reason why I felt that they were torsos is because I was doing a series of torso forms uh, on the wall coming from the Venus figurine from way back when I was doing my PhD. Um, so I'm always doing the female form more so than the male form. I, I tend to do the female form and. Um, it's like a woman with a waistline and uh, yeah. breast, waistline and hips. It's the same old Venus figurine, but now done very differently. Yeah. But to, then I started getting involved with color, right? Because this was one of the, uh, uh, this is a acrylic patina. They're gold and uh, coppers and gold uh, metallic paints. And then uh, the blue green inside, I wanted to look like oxidized copper. And I just thought the two the two really went together very well. The colors went together really well. And when I make these pieces, these are fairly small. They're about two feet, 24 yeah. inches, 18 to 24 inches. So they're not very large. So I would, I would roll out a very big slab on my slab machine. And then I just throw it down. I'd start playing with it and maneuvering it. And there again is the process, the part of making this and, and plump, plumping it up with uh, supports underneath until I got the form to go the way I want. So um, if you find creatures, that's great. If you find a figure, that's great. The idea of the E, e major, it just, I, well, music has also been a great part of my life. I played piano from third grade to high school. And then again, in my 40s, I took up jazz. Now I don't play so much, but I listen to jazz every single day in my studio. And the old classical forms of, there was a Chopin E flat major that I loved so much. And this just mm -hmm. made me feel like mm -hmm. this is music. And a lot of my work has music titles to it because they are rhythmic and they make me feel like music. Do you listen to music when you're in the studio working? Yes, I listen to jazz most of the time in the studio. Yeah. Um, well, the piece that uh, my wife and I have is only the gold, and it's yes. even more feminine, more uh, identifiable as a female form. And when you say uh, the ancient Venus, you mean the Venus of Willendorf is the one that's most often reproduced in basic text. So probably uh, all of our audience are familiar with that. That's what you're referring to, right? Yes. Yeah. And then on this, you've mentioned seashells and growing up near the uh, sea. And the color here is, of course, very important. And this piece makes me think more of um, sea creatures like sea cucumbers and um, even various kinds of octopi and squid. So that's all fair game. Little seahorsey. Okay, yeah, that too, the, the shape is uh, right. seahorsey. Uh, is surrealism uh, something that you've thought about and the way that the surrealists would think about forms like this? Um, I'm not, I, I'm intrigued by surrealism, but I've never been that attracted to it. The only thing that I can think of, you know, that this is surrealistic with is the, uh, you know, the dripping clocks, you know, that has yeah. that kind of yeah. attitude towards oh. it. Yeah. 
but um, I've never been that attracted to it. It's more surrealistic art to me is more intellectual than feeling, mm -hmm. than manipulative. And I'm more manipulative than intellectual right. in my artwork. Yep. I'm intellectual with my writing. Yeah. I, I, but not so much in the artwork. Yeah. Well, that really makes sense when you look at your uh, the works that you have produced. Uh, Martha, I think we need to move along. Jane and I are having such a good conversation here. Uh, now, why th this is the same kind of material, right? Yes. And it's the same basic formal vocabulary. But this, to me, has a completely different emotional resonance. Am I am I on track or? Am yeah, I on... to me this is this was almost very foreboding and a little scary. Yeah, and it's big. I mean, the the beauty of the piece is its size. It's it's very large. And did, did you start out with that intention? No, not with this piece. It was funny the way this piece this piece started um, as I the middle piece was the piece. And then the other two pieces, um, it's three pieces, the middle piece and the right and the left piece. Uh -huh. And the other two pieces uh, were, were going to be other pieces. And I was playing around with them on the table one day and I, all of a sudden it came to me, I saw it. And I put the pieces together and I said, this is it. This is just, this is exactly the way it should have been. And I remember, um, I remember studying Peter Volkus, who was a ceramic sculptor, mm -hmm. very famous in the 20th century ceramic sculptor. And he always made parts <laughs> and then assembled the parts. And I th did we lose you? No, something just broke up. Um, oh, okay. Now you sound- And he always, I, and I got into that, I used to get into that thought about, uh, you know, assemblage, yeah. taking different forms and putting together. And I just saw this. And did you, and I asked this, I don't normally ask this because it doesn't normally seem very relevant at all, but did you sell this piece? No, in fact, people, I can't even get this piece into a show. People have a hard time with it. You're kidding. Yeah, I think they find it too, too foreboding. Scary. It, it is foreboding, I would say that, but I think that it's uh, foreboding in the sense that it provokes you to think about why you feel that way and what does this represent? And, you know, I, I think it's a very powerful work, but that's just me. And, you know, if you've looked at my photographs, maybe you see why, I, <laughs> why I'm responding to this in a very uh, positive way, although I agree it's foreboding. Okay, I think, what do we have? One more or two more, Martha? I think we, we must have two more, Jane. Do we have two more, I think? Yeah, after this, you have two paintings, which I would like to show people because we yes. uh, can go through this quickly. This is one of my newest of these uh, vessels uh, where I'm working with um, a very classic form in the bottom and the folded uh, business that I do on the top, to the, the juxtaposition of the two forms. Well, I think that's that's a very interesting direction. Is this something that you're doing more of, this kind of combination? Yes, this is right now. I okay. just finished this about two weeks ago. Oh, well, uh, I encourage you to continue. Uh, Thank you. Uh, let's see one of those uh, paintings then. Uh, this piece uh, was, as you can see, the form is very much like my little wall sculptures. And I do, I do like playing with this. I like working with the canvas. I, I get canvas on a roll and I play with the canvas in glue until it starts to firm up. I use Elmer's glue, I get by the gallon and I paint this until it gets kind of firmish. And then I start playing with it the same way I used to play with my slabs. And then I, figure out how I want to present it on the canvas. Where the next piece that, I'm, that you're seeing, um, the, the piece that's after this is more determined of, of, a, of a more classical form of a, of a mountain that I wanted to do. But this is just for, pure form. And in fact, it was so pure to me that I called it white on white because the form is a metallic white and the canvas is mm -hmm. flat white. And I love this whole, white on white thing. 
but the folded and rippling form is the same kind of canvas as the white canvas uh, rectangle? The rectangle is a commercial canvas that I buy. Okay. It's a, I buy it at Michael's. I bought a canvas and I, you know, yeah. just set out and painted it. The other one is canvas that I buy on a roll and I cut that canvas and I manipulate that once it's immersed in glue and starts to firm up. Mm -hmm. I can manipulate it and then as it gets harder and I get the form that I like, then I actually paint it over and over for a few days. I go back to it and it firms up hard. So it's actually a very hard uh, form. And this is the new, this is my new work that I'm doing with canvas. Yeah. Um, well, before we look at the last uh, piece uh, and then take some questions, is there any particular uh, artist, uh, event, show that made you take this direction of dealing with the uh, shaped and manipulated canvases? This, no. This was just something that, I don't know, I just, I wanted to work with shaped canvases. I, you know, from Frank Stella on, there were a lot of people that worked with, with shaped canvases. But, um, and then I saw, I saw quite a few, when I was in Spain again, I saw, they, Spain is a lot, they're into wall pieces, wall, a lot yeah. of wall. Yeah. And, and um, I saw a lot of things where people were taking canvases. The BMA had a great show, um, Contemporary Black Artists, uh, but it must've been a year or two ago because you know it's been a year since I've been there. Um, <laughs> but they had some really great, um, they had one canvas that was like draped down, coming down like a, like a like a rainfall. People are playing around with canvas and they're manipulating yes. it. And I've been involved with that. So it's not that I saw anybody doing this. It's just, I saw people using canvas, not to paint on yeah. solely, but to sculpt with, and then yet to work with it as a painting. Yeah. Well, let's uh, look at your last piece. Um, they're all so great. I really want to make sure everybody gets a chance to see them. Uh, just quickly uh, tell us a little bit about this and then we'll take some questions. Um, this is called High Peaks. It's, um, I love the mountains. I, when I lived up in upstate New York, I got very involved with the Adirondacks. So I just love being in the mountains. I love being in the woods. And I just thought it would be fun to work with mountains because I'd have another one that I just finished off. And it's a place for me to play with the shaped canvas and make this three-dimensional mountain on a flat sky. It's, it's mounted on a, on a canvas, but the, uh, the sculpted part is once again, it's the canvas that I dip in glue and I firm up and I manipulate it till I get it to the point that it becomes what it becomes. Would you be, uh, I hope you won't be offended if I say that when I saw this, I thought of uh, Helen Frankenthaler uh, become more robust, sort of more vigorous and, and forceful. Uh, you know, her famous mountains in sea, the canvas. That's you could the, never offend me by saying that makes this makes you think of Helen Frankenthaler. Well, good. Good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it's been wonderful talking with you, but we only have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so let's go ahead and take some questions. Who wants to go first? Chris? You've always well, I one. see we have a host of them in the chat, actually. And unless the uh, asker would like to say it themselves, I can do it also, um, depending on what you guys want to do. But we'll take you know hands first. So anyone who wants to talk. Okay. Uh, Malka asks, how do you attach the ceramics to the wood? Uh, with a glue, uh, depending upon the size of the piece. When I was working in like five foot pieces, I was using something called Thinset. It's a generic name for uh, an epoxy mortar. Because oh. uh, it obviously had to be very, very strong. There were bigger pieces but I don't work very large anymore. Um, the largest I work now is like two, two feet or three feet, the largest. And I use um, commercial glues that I get in, at Home Depot. They changes depending upon what they're putting out there. 
Okay, we have a question from Bob Madden who asks, uh, what kind of jazz do you listen to? Love Keith Jarrett. I'm, I'm an old jazz. I'm, I'm stuck in a certain period of jazz. I love Keith Jarrett and I love Bill Evans. I, I love um, Miles Davis. I, oh, yeah. I listen to oh. very old fashioned jazz. Yeah. yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In fact, I, I yeah, sometimes I don't listen to my own playlist. I listen to uh, Pandora and I have a, the Keith Jarrett and, and the uh, Bill Evans stations. And they're really great because you um, you have a uh, like Keith Jarrett station. So it plays like two or three Keith Jarrett's and then it plays all these other um, artists and musicians that are in the style of Keith Jarrett. So I'm learning about all these new people that I, you know, I've never gotten their music, you know, albums before or anything. So actually listening to things, it was great. Yeah, I think that's great, a great thing. Other questions? Martha, do we have more? Uh, Bob, you did one of the emojis. Do you want to say more? Or were you just excited about uh, Jane's selection? Bob? I'm unmuted now. I'm sorry. What was the question again? Uh, I saw that you had posted one of the emojis in um, the chat function. Are you trying to just um, clap for her choice of jazz musicians, or did you well, have a I, I liked, question? I like the whole all the whole presentation. The art is terrific, of course, but uh, I was just interested in what kind of jazz she listens to because I do that too as well. When I'm when I'm uh, I have a a station in, in Toronto, Canada that I listen to when I'm working. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Chris Fowler. Uh, do you start with an attention or do you just start and presume that the piece will come to clarity as you work on it? Both. There are some times where I'll be, wake, I'll be sleeping and I'll wake up in the middle of the night and there's a thought and I need to pursue that and I'll really pursue it. I could even research it, even looking at different th other people's work. So I'll go in that direction. But then there are the times where I just say, well, I'm going to work with slabs or I'm going to work with canvas or I'm going to, and I just go and I do it and I let the work come out. You know, instead, I guess that's that old Michelangelo thing. Let you know, let the work come out, and you just take it away. Yeah. I just let it happen. But um, I don't, I don't premeditate a lot. I can do. I've just done a little series of small um, vessels, very uh, small little ones that I'm just started working on. I knew I wanted to do a series of these little jeweled uh, bowls, all folded bowls. Let's say. And I did six of them and they're just, they're just, um, they're all fired. I'm just now dealing with the surface of it. So I had the intention that I wanted to do a series of small little bowls, but how they looked and how they were going to be, that, that unfolded. Good yeah, question. I imagine also. <laughs> okay, um, we are very close to the hour. And I must apologize. I have two more Zooms scheduled for this evening. Oh, so gosh. I'm going to have to thank Martha for her help. Uh, thank uh, Jane for a wonderful conversation and uh, uh, thank her for sharing her beautiful artwork and thank all of you for tuning in. Uh, you know, we've recently gone to uh, every other week, but because of Collector's Choice, we'll be back one week from today. Uh, and so Martha, did you want to make some more announcements before we? Yes, I have two announcements. Uh, so we'll be talking next week with Jen Sterling. She's an abstract painter. Uh, she's recently come on to the MFA board. So she's getting really involved with what's going on here. Um, but I do have another announcement that tomorrow Collector's Choice opens at Circle Gallery. So if you'd like to come see one of Jane's work in uh, real life, uh, it's here at the gallery. Uh, you're also possibly able to get it if you purchase a ticket to the event, which will be uh, March 21st over Zoom. So what we're doing right now is very similar to how collector's shows will look. <laughs> all right. Thank you all and uh, enjoy your evening. See you next week. Thank, Thank you. you. And good luck with collector's choice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>